Philippians chapter three, the apostle Paul wrote, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect. In other words, he says, I've, I've not arrived spiritually somewhere. He said this, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing. Somebody shout one thing. One thing thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. And then listen to this. He says it again. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, another word there, better translation would be mature, have this attitude. Now, you got to see the humor in Scripture, all right, in this next phrase. Paul says, and if any of you have a different attitude, if you see it different, then God will reveal that to you also. In other words, God will show you I'm right. (laughs) However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. I want to talk to you about getting a forward in your spirit. I want to impart, if I could, into your heart a forward, a lean in, uh, a press in your spirit. Let's pray together today. Jesus, we love you. We haven't come to do some religious exercise. We've come to hear from you. So Spirit of the living God, speak to every one of us, no matter where we are on the journey of faith. Our hearts are open. Our minds are receptive. May we never be the same in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Hey, can you put your hands together for your worship teams at every campus? Wow, wow, wow. You guys have some gifts in the house. Good night. We could have just worshiped all day. I'd have been fine with that. I was like, hey, let's just keep going. What a mighty God. Let's just stay on that a while. How many of you uh, enjoy vacations? You got some summer vacations? Come on, wave a little bit. You like getting out of town? Get out of the rat race? Yeah. We we have two types of um, experiences in our house. One we call a trip. One we call a vacation. A trip is all six of us. A vacation is me and my wife. Can I get an amen in the house of God today? (laughs) So last summer we were on vacation. Just me and her. Come on, baby girl. Me, her, little Luther Vandross. That's how we got in all that trouble in the first place. No, I digress. Pastor Stephen won't let me back. So we went on this vacation, and I don't know about y'all, but on vacation, I don't want to do anything. I work hard. I want to rest hard. You know what I'm saying? So my routine is get up whenever I want to wake up, because there ain't no little kids coming in my room at 6.15. That little guy, that three-year-old, that everybody's like, oh, look at him. He wakes up at 6.15 every day, y'all, every day. So no little feet coming in. I want to get up when I want to get up. I want to get dressed and go lay by the ocean. I don't want to get in it because I ain't all about the sand. I just want to hear it and look at it. Can I get an amen? Amen. I want want lunch at some point. Then I want to go back to my chair. I want to lay there until it's time to go to the room and take a nap. (laughs) Then I want to get dressed up nice. I want a great meal, a great experience. Then I want to repeat that for seven days. That's vacation to me. So we were on a vacation. We went on with some friends last summer, and they were like, hey, we should do an excursion together. I was like, that doesn't fit in the routine. But I was like, okay, I won't be, you know, I won't rain on everybody's parade, so I'll do the, I'll do the excursion. And so what we did is we got a, a boat. I don't even know if any of this was official. We were out, out of the country, and we got, they were like, this guy was like, I got you. Got a boat, cash, money. Yeah, I don't think any of it was legit, but we went. So we go out on this boat and they're like, you're going to jump off the boat and then you're going to swim into these three different caves. And then the last experience is a cliff jumping experience. So we went in the caves, all all six of us, there's three couples we swim in. My wife was loving it until the bats flew out of one cave. Then she's back on the boat real fast. They were like, one of these caves is where Pirates of the Caribbean, a scene was filmed in this cave, and we were, I don't, it was probably a lie, but it was cool. And, you know, who knows if that's true or not? 
Um, there was no brochure. It was some guy walking on the beach that we gave money to. And this is really bad the more I think about this. As I tell the story, I'm like, we could have died. I could not be here. Left my children without parents. And so, but we went to this last one and, and it's this famous cliff jumping and they got like a restaurant up on top of this cliff and the whole thing. And so we went up and it's 25 foot cliff. And so four of the six of us did the cliff jumping. And so I went up with the group and, and we had to swim over and the boat created a wake. So it was like a hard swim over. You got over there, your shoulders were pretty tired. You went up the ladder, you went up another ladder and then you got up and there were locals up pointing to a sign saying no lifeguards on duty. You know, if you jump, this could cause bodily harm and injury at your own risk, all that. It was the day before my 45th birthday. I know I look 29. Day before my 45th birthday. And so I was like, I'm doing this last day of 44, jumping off a cliff. I still got it. So I like, yeah, I read it. I understand. No liability. And so I walk up to the cliff. The guy in front of me is our chief of staff. And he's a former like Navy task force, special ops guy, kind of guy. And like, he's up at 4.30 every morning running seven miles. That kind of kind of tells you his makeup. So he goes up right into the cliff and like a pencil, he jumps like a little torpedo, like <laughs> right into the water. I was like, all right. And the guy standing there, the logo's like, stay stiff like a pencil. I was like, great. So I look over because I'm like, I want to make sure I don't hit any rocks. That'd be bad from 25 feet up, right? So I step out and I jump looking down, which bends my body like this. So I'm falling through the air. Y'all are laughing. That's nice. Like, <laughs> like this. And I, I impact the water on the back of my thighs. Yeah, that's how I felt. So I still have to swim back to the boat. I come up out of the water and I was hurting y'all. My back was in pain. So I swim over to the boat and I'm, you know, I get up and Tammy goes, that didn't look good. <laughs> I was like, no, it wasn't. She goes, when did you know it was going bad? I said, halfway down. <laughs> I had a massive bruise on the back of my leg for a couple of weeks, but my back was hurting, and this was day two of a week vacation. So I felt the leading of the Holy Spirit to go to the spa twice for massages to work on my back, but I couldn't get rid of the pain, and it was radiating from my shoulder blades. Now, I don't know about y'all, but whenever I can't get answers to something, my mind goes to a dark place. I did the, the sin of all sins. I web MD'd what was wrong with my back. Come on, y'all. Google will take you to the pits of hell. And I'm looking at all this stuff, and I'm like, I've got a bulge disc. I'm going to have to have back surgery. Like, my mind went dark places. I was like, I'm going to have to resign the church. Like, I want to be able to stand up and preach ever again. My, my Jonas will never be able to have his dad wrestle with him and roll in the floor again. Like, are y'all following me? Like, I had myself on a walker in back surgery. And I did, I mean, I was just reading this stuff and my mind was going to dark places and fear was creeping up. And I just thought you're too old to be doing this. Like you need to be playing it safe. You've got responsibilities. Like, what are you thinking? You got kids. You got one that won't be graduating high school till you're 60. Like you need to keep your, yeah, that's right. Y'all you need to keep your body intact. Like you've got Responsible. You got employees, you got college, you got all these things that you're responsible for. You need to learn to play it safe. And I'll tell you something. While I was thinking this, the Spirit of God whispered to me, you can do that with your body, but you better not do that with your faith. And here's what I feel like some of us have done, is that we've had moments where we took the leap of faith. And it didn't turn out exactly the way that we thought it should. And we've allowed playing it safe to creep into our faith. Or maybe it's that over the past couple of years, we've had so many stops and starts. I, I know people have experienced that through the season that just we came out of where it was like, well, I planned a vacation, then I had to cancel it. And I, I thought my kids were going to school and then they weren't going to school. And, and after so many stops and starts and making plans and cancel plans, you kind of get to the point of why try? Adam Grant, a organizational psychologist, wrote the most downloaded article in the t history, I think, of the New York Times. And he said there is a third kind of middle stepchild of mental health, and it is called languishing. And he said that's where the majority of Americans are right now. Our life isn't thriving, but we're not in depression. We're just kind of, eh. The marriage isn't all that we want it to be. 
but it's not going to file for divorce. It's just kind of, eh. and the finances aren't where we want them to be, but we're not filing bankruptcy. It's just kind of, eh. and if we're not careful, our walk with God won't be passionate on fire where we want it to be, but we're not walking away from it either. It's just kind of, eh. And I've just come to maybe impart some faith into you to say it's time to move forward. It's time to get what the apostle Paul had in him where he said, I'm forgetting what is behind and I'm pressing forward to what is ahead. If I could do anything to you, it would be to impart a forward into your spirit that goes, I may not have gone the way I wanted it to. I may have jumped before and experienced a little discomfort, but I'm not going to stay here languishing. I'm not going to stay in this comfortable place. I'm moving. Somebody shout forward. I want I want you to get a little ridiculous. David was sent by his father out to the battlefield and he was taking a little charcuterie board. Read your Bible. Said a little cheese and meat. And he walks up on, a, on Goliath, you know the story, making fun of the armies of Israel and nobody from Israel will go out to fight him. It's interesting to me in the text that David says this. He doesn't say, who is this Philistine? He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine coming against the armies of God. Here's what David was saying is why are we scared of a giant who is not under the covenant of God when we, the people of God are under his covenant and his, here's what he was saying in new Testament terms. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It's time for the church of Jesus to stop languishing, to stop living in comfort. It's time to move forward. Forward. David said, I'll go fight him. Saul said to him in one translation, don't be ridiculous. And that's what the enemy's been whispering in your ear. You think that marriage can be healed? Don't be ridiculous. You think you can start that business? Don't be ridiculous. You think your child can come back to God? Don't be ridiculous. You think you can get financial breakthrough? Don't be ridiculous. I'm here to tell you God is looking for some ridiculous people that will say, I'll just take God at his word. I'll believe him for what he says. Somebody shout forward. I love that the apostle Paul said, but this one thing I do. It was a singular focus. It, it, he could have said a lot of things there. He could have said, this one thing I do is worship. And we would have all read the text and been like, that's admirable, Paul. Worship, God inhabits the praises of his people. Worship invokes the presence of God. In the presence of God, anything is possible. This should be the one thing we do. But he didn't say that. He could have said, this one thing I do is read the word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That would be a great thing to do. He could have said, this one thing I do is pray. Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. But he said, this one thing I do, I forget. I love that. It's not the thing you think he would say. He said, this one thing I do is I forget. I forget. Some of you need some spiritual amnesia. Some of you need that all of our little, come on online. You need a little like men in black. Like everybody look here. I'm showing my age. If you hadn't seen the movie, it's a great one. You, you need to forget. I would propose you need to forget two things. Number one, you need to forget your mistakes. So many of you are stuck in languishing and not stepping towards the purpose of God and the call of God and not following the word of the Lord over your life because the enemy has you living in your past mistakes. That he constantly is reminding you of what you used to do and that decision you made and that, that sign language you gave that car on the interstate this, like yes on the way to church, let's be real. And he will paralyze you. You think God could ever use you? You've been through a divorce. 
You think God could ever use you? Look at the way you talk to that person. You think God could ever use you? Remember when you used to hang out in the bar? You think God could ever use you? And he'll constantly be reminding you of your past. I have to wonder if the Apostle Paul, as he penned those words, thought, I'm forgetting what lies behind. I wonder if he thought about holding the cloaks of the people who stoned Stephen and goes, no, 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 I'm forgetting what lies behind. I wonder if he thought about the Christians that he killed and he wrote, no, I'm forgetting what lies behind. I wonder if he thought about all the persecution he did to the church early in the New Testament and thought, no, I'm forgetting what lies behind. I'm just wanting to tell you this one thing you ought to do is forget. One thing you ought to do is not let the enemy remind you of your past, keep you stuck in your present so that you can't step into your destiny. I heard one preacher say, every time the enemy reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. I'm forgetting what lies behind. Paul had a singular focus. But I would also recommend that we forget our successes. When we remember our successes, we can get stuck in nostalgia. Man, remember the good old days? Well, can I remind you, the days weren't as good as you remember them. Come on now. The further we get away from a success, the more we glamorize the success. We forget the pain it took to get there. We forget the grit it took to get there. We forget the long nights and the early mornings that it took to get to that place. So y'all follow me. We over glamorize it the further we get removed from it. It's kind of like being at a funeral and you people get done and you're like, I don't know who they were talking about. That joker was a fool. They got up there like he was the king. Come on, y'all know I'm telling the truth. Some of you are like, that preacher needs to repent. I knew that guy. A couple years ago, we loaded the whole six of us us and drove to Disney. Yeah, all of them. That's 12 hours without stops. We didn't get out of the neighborhood. We there yet? My screen don't work. I'm like, you have a screen in a car that is moving. What are you complaining about? When I was a kid on road trips, my sisters took the seats. I slept in the floorboard. Before seatbelt law, I'm showing my age. I actually, I remember climbing up in the back of, you know that little flat part in the back of old cars? I'd climb up there in the sun and sleep. Anyways. I digress. Dad, the Wi-Fi in the car ain't work. I'm like, what you talking about Wi-Fi in the car? You spoiled. You. So we get there and we have a wonderful vacation. A couple years later, after that, I, I made a covenant with the Lord that I would never drive those children further than the grocery store <laughs> all at the same time. Are y'all f- <laughs> like, that's, that's the limit. Grocery store and school. A couple years later, airline prices through the roof. All, we're like, Tammy goes, why don't we drive? I was like, it wasn't that bad last time. <laughs> we drove again. This time I journaled so that I could remind myself of the hell that I endured. Are y'all following me? Because the further you get away from an event, the more you glamorize the event. And if you don't forget your successes, you will begin to believe that it's you that got you to where you are now. And it is the you that can get you. And can I tell you, but for the grace of God in your life, where would you be right now? The only reason to look back is to look back and express worship to God for his faithfulness in our life. Paul said, this one thing I do is I forget. I want to, can I teach for a minute? The, The word forget in the original Greek language is the opposite of remembering. You're like, Pastor Stephen brought this guy in. Hang with me. So to understand forgetting in its totality, I have to understand remembering from a biblical perspective. 
Remembering from a biblical perspective is not that I just can recall an event. Remembering in a biblical perspective is this, is that I can dig up from my history so I can recall an event in my history. I can bring that event into my present in such a way that it has potency in my current reality. In other words, I dig up something from my history. I bring it into my current reality to the place that it can affect my emotion. It can affect my outlook. It can affect my thought process. It has potency. It affects me currently. This is why the Bible encourages us all the time to remember the goodness of God. I've been reading in, in, the, New, in the Old Testament again how God brought Israel out. And he said, remember the Lord your God. He's constantly telling them, remember the Lord your God. Remember the Lord your God. When you get successful and you are in the land, remember the Lord your God. Seems to be this cycle with Israel is that they're redeemed. They get delivered. They get blessed. And then they forget God. And he says, remember the Lord your God. Remember the Lord your God. Why? Because there's going to come a moment when you're in a dark place, you're in a desert, you're in a valley moment, and you need to be able to pull from your history that God was faithful then, he'll be faithful now, and he'll be faithful into my future. And so this is how Christians in the middle of chaos all around us don't have to have chaos in us because I remember that I've got a God who I can cast all my cares on because he cares for me. I remember that the peace of God, which passes understanding, can fill my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And so Paul says, I'm forgetting what lies behind so much so that it doesn't affect my current reality. So I forget the mistakes. So much so. That when the enemy comes up against me and goes, but you're a failure, but you couldn't keep the marriage together, but you're broke, but you've sinned, but you slept around by the grace of God and the forgiveness of Jesus over our life. He says, I forget what is behind. I'm letting that go. I'm pressing forward to what is ahead. I'm thankful for the grace of God. I'm thankful for the, can I go old school, for the blood of Jesus that has cleansed all of my sin, that has delivered me, set me free. I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm pressing forward. Somebody shout forward. I love that the Apostle Paul twice in the text said, I'm pressing forward. If I'm pressing, it means something is resisting. So we're good at the moment of shouting, forgetting what lies behind. My sins aren't on my account anymore. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. I know I look white. You are so fun. I love this church. I feel at home. This feels good. We like the moment of I'm forgetting my sin. I'm moving forward. God's got destiny for me. But what about whenever to get you to where God wants to take you, he's got to build something in you that only comes through resistance. I'm pressing. If I'm pressing, something's pressing back against me. Remember, remember that gym plan you had in January? I'm giving you a minute to recall. <laughs> the whole idea of weight training is through resistance. You break down the muscle. Obviously, you can tell I spent a lot of time there. It's not funny. I'm kidding. I don't. The whole idea is that through resistance, the weightiness of the weight tears down the muscle. So when it heals, it comes back stronger and builds more. It's the whole idea. I got into running several years ago and, and got into, um, I have to have something competitive to keep me interested in something. And so I did some races and half marathons and a couple of marathons. And, and, and there was a moment where I would feel this resistance. My body could do more, but my mind was like, Nobody's chasing you, fool. Why are you still run? <laughs> but when I push through the resistance, 
I gained more endurance so that I could go more miles. Are you following me? Sometimes God will allow in your life some resistance to come because you are, he's got destiny and purpose. He is not confined by time. He's outside of time. So God saw your beginning and your end all at the same time. He saw the moment your mother gave birth to you and the moment you died all at the same time. So he knows your beginning from end. So, which means he knows what is coming around the bend tomorrow, next week, next month. He knows what kind of strength you're going to need, what kind of faith you're going to need, what heavy lifting you're going to have to do in the year ahead. And so because he's a loving father, He will build it into you now before you get there. Are you following me? But you've got to face the resistance. But here's what we do. We pray prayers like God bless me. God favor me. These are great prayers. Nothing wrong with them. God use me. God increase my influence. God make me a vessel. God, help me to make a difference in my school, in my work, in my community. And God goes, oh, we can, let's do this. I'm all about this. But what he doesn't tell you is, I want to do that, but I've got to build something in you first. So then he allows some resistance to come into your life. And how many of you know that often God uses the sandpaper of other people to rough out the, the rough edges on your life? But here's what we do. I think God thinks we're schizophrenic sometimes. Because we're like, God, use me. God, bless me. God, I want more of you. God, I want, a bo- God, I want breakthrough in my life. And God's like, all right, I'm going to use you. I'm going to bless you. And then resistance comes. And we're like, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke the devil that's after my life. Right? And God's like, whoa, whoa, time out. I thought you wanted to be used. I thought you wanted to grow. I needed to develop your character because your competencies could take you where your character couldn't keep you. So I needed to build something in you. So I had to allow resistance into your life. Paul said, I've got to press in my spirit. I'm pressing. There's some things resisting, but I'm pressing. There's some things pushing against me, but I'm pressing. Some things have fallen around me. Some chaos has tried, but I'm still pressing. And some of us, we allowed this last season or last decade or however long of our life to take our press away. And our muscles of faith are in atrophy. Because we haven't been using them. Because you will lose what you don't use. And it's not God trying to get you. It's God trying to grow you. And so you could be rebuking the very thing that God is using to build something in you for the next level of faith he wants to take you to. Somebody shout, I got to press. I can hear the apostle Paul right now. He says it twice, not once, twice. The Bible says something once you ought to listen. Twice you ought to really listen. He says twice I'm pressing. He was trying to, I think, signal to us, hey, it ain't going to be easy. I've been shipwrecked, but I'm pressing. I've been snake bit, but I'm pressing. I've been called a God and a called a devil on the same day, but I'm pressing. They put me in house arrest in Rome, but I'm pressing. I just want to say over your life, they may have fired you from the job, but keep pressing. He may have walked out of your life, but keep pressing. Your kids may have cursed you to your face, but keep pressing. There may be financial issues, but keep pressing. Somebody shout, I'm pressing. You got to get a press in your spirit. If not, you will languish. You'll languish in the in between. You won't be thriving and it won't be falling apart, but it won't be everything God has for you. You can settle for comfort. Listen to me. You can settle for comfort and go to heaven one day and it'll be wonderful. But my Bible tells me that I can have heaven today. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So evidently on earth should look like heaven and I can have that today, but I got to press to get there. Somebody shout, I got to press. All right. One final thought. He says, I'm pressing on towards the upward call. 
There's no motivation to press if you don't believe there's a better tomorrow. And for some of you, it's not that you don't want to press. You don't believe there's anything pressing towards. And it's not that you've lost your faith for salvation. You've just lost your faith for a better tomorrow. And Paul said, I've got an upward calling. I think Paul understood that he moves us from glory to glory, from victory to victory. But here's the problem with most of us, myself included, is we want glory to glory to be Monday to Tuesday. Let's be real. Monday morning to lunch on Monday. (laughs) Fix it, Jesus. Yesterday. And God's more committed to your conformity to the image of his son than he is your comfort. And if you're anything like me, a lot of times we're slow learners. And it's not that God is lacking on his promises. He's moving at the speed of our obedience. And there's no need to have this singular focus and this press in my spirit if I don't believe God has something better for me. And could I stir the measure of faith that's in you? I don't have any faith. No, no, no. The Bible says God's given everybody a measure of faith. I'm not talking about faith for salvation. That's, salvation is the work of Jesus. It's by grace. It's not of your works so that you don't get the credit. I don't get the credit. It's, it's the grace of God. In our, I'm talking about faith to believe for what God has on your life for today. Can I teach you for one second? Faith isn't what you feel. Faith isn't a song. Faith isn't a shout. Faith isn't a dance. Faith isn't a hop. It isn't a twirl. Have at it. That's not faith. The Bible says faith is the evidence. And it is the substance. Evidence, from what I understand, is something that is observable that would lead in a court of law to a conviction. So having faith in your life isn't something you muster up to go, I'm going to believe more. No, it's that there is observable evidence in your actions that leads people to believe you believe what God said. And here's the deal. Here's what you got to get is that you won't have that kind of faith if you're waiting till you feel it. Because sometimes faith is getting the word of the Lord, moving forward when it doesn't feel it, when you can't see it. But here's the deal. If you're going to walk in this type of faith, write this down. You have got to learn to go off what God says, not off what you see. Because what you see isn't often what God said, but you keep moving forward anyways. Are you following me? Sometimes all you see is a sea in front of you, but God said, I'm about to deliver you from Pharaoh, but Pharaoh is running after you. You got to go, no, no. Pharaoh may be breathing down my neck, but I know what he said. And I may not be able to see it. I may not see the breakthrough yet, but I know what he said, that he's got good plans for me and they're to prosper me and not harm me and give me a hope and a future. I don't see it yet, but I know what he said, that he'll do exceedingly abundantly and above anything I can ask or imagine. I don't see it yet, but I know what he said, that no weapon formed against me will prosper. This is the inheritance of those who know God. I'm pressing by faith. I've got evidence. So here's my question. If someone followed you for a day, would there be enough evidence to convict you of faith? Would they look at their life and go, they're faith people. 
I can tell by the way they talk, by the way they live, by the way they walk. There is evidence and there is substance of faith. When you believe there's a better tomorrow, you'll press forward. When you believe there's a better tomorrow, you'll forget what is behind. Because I'm moving. Somebody shout forward. Put your hands together if you receive the word today. I want to pray for you. If you would, bow your head, close your eyes at all of our locations online, if you're able to. I believe this is an on-time word for some, some today. That you lost your press. And you just kind of settled in for whatever reason. And honestly, the reason doesn't matter. What matters is God's in this place. I believe he'll give you the divine enablement you need. To press again. To step up on the edge of the cliff and go, it didn't turn out like I wanted it to last time, but God, if you say go, I'll go again. If you say leap, I'll leap again. You say jump, I'll jump again. So I wouldn't embarrass you for the world, no one looking around, but if you'd say, Pastor, that's me. This word was for me. I needed it. I need a fresh press in my spirit. If that's you, you just shoot your hand up high every location. Just put it up high in the air, high in the air. Hands all over the room. Keep it up. Keep it up. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see every hand. More importantly, you know every story. I just pray right now, God, a divine impartation of a forward lean in their spirit. I pray, God, a divine enablement come over them right now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, empower them. Open their eyes to greater faith. Embolden their spirit to lean in, to press forward into everything you have for them. We love you. We receive it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. Love you, Union Church.